Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here and crush your party. And I think, you know, I, I, I learn a lot, and, you know, I, I think there are interesting opportunities because you solve kind of the same problem, right? We have the zoo of these sports fields, and we try to, you know, uh, make something out of it. Uh, you know, the OpenFF consortium kind of started top down approach, right? You use the microscopic properties to fit your parameters. So I'm coming from computational chemistry background. We, we do, you know, bottom up approach. We, we start from strong principles and going up. So probably we'll meet somewhere in halfway in between. Um, basically today I'd like to talk about some of our research some projects when we use machine learning to solve some of the uh, long-standing issues in computational chemistry. Uh, we're currently in transition, so I'm at UNC Chapel Hill, but we're changing colors and moving up north, and, but hopefully we'll do the same. And I'll skip the uh, you know, introduction, but I'd like to start you know, acknowledging you know, uh, really smart students who I have privileged to work. You know, um, my lab at, at UNC, especially Roman and Katy, you know, my partner in crime, uh, group of Adrian Royberg, University of Florida, funding mostly NSA, ONR, collaboration with Los Alamos, and big shout out to the big machines, because as you will see, we use a lot of uh, quantum mechanical calculations. So I, I kind of think about machine learning and AI tools as the Swiss Army knife. So it has its own utility, but it's not perfect. Uh, but uh, we found, you know, several use cases. So <clears throat> my lab uh, is also part of the what's called Upload Consortium. It's a high throughput uh, computational initiative for inorganic materials, and we develop a lot of predictive models uh, for um, inorganic materials. Think about, you know, ceramics, alloy, things like that. We also apply to two-dimensional materials. We uh, we use a machine learning to guide chemical experiments in material science. You know, we also use uh, develop some tools for visualization of chemical space. Um, one of my interests been in a uh, school of pharmaceutical science with drug discovery, and we work also in what's called uh, generative models and machine to kind of open a brain and medicinal chemist and to kind of start to dream uh, in, in in molecules. Uh, but in this talk, I. I you know, I, I talk about our work in quantum mechanics and how machine learning could accelerate uh, quantum mechanical calculation. So essentially, if you think about this kind of cartoon representation, so you have uh, a graph when you have a method of different scaling versus some kind of metric of accuracy. Uh, we can argue about that, you know, sports field can be extremely accurate if you parameterize, but generally, you know, if you look for you know, transferable force field. The problem is you have this uncertainty that can be really good and quite accurate, but they can be terribly wrong. And in many cases, we have no idea. Because if you take, you know, UFF, you, you put some uranium hexafluoride, you can still run it and it will not complain, but the question is what you'll get out of it. And then we have, um, you know, the empirical methods, for example, XPD, you know, functional, you know, conventional DFT theory is scaling N cube, and the gold, gold standard in the organic world would be uh, CCSD with, uh, with triples, and, and basically you can put those error bars and basically they systematically uh, converge until you reach the heaven of the full CI, which is which a dream. Uh, basically, uh, what we tried to do, because of that extreme sp scaling, this we try to push those methods to this left uh, top corner when you have advantage of fast compute, but hopefully maintain, uh, you know, the <coughs> low error bar of quantum mechanics. So one, one of, you know, if you think about, you know, this uh, quantum mechanics 101, so the Schrodinger equation, some independent, in our case, we use uh, CONTRAM, uh, DFT equation, but if you look on it, and kind of rearrange all the complexity, we can come up with this way. So the ground state energy, actually, the, yes, it's a magic function f uh, uh, with respect to molecular coordinate. That's a regression problem. That's, you know, uh, and so this is what we do. Take neural networks, 
feed molecules to the neural network, you get run state energy. The neural network is differentiable. It can back propagate, have your gradients. Now we can do geometry linearization, molecular dynamics. Uh, we can also do hash chance and things like that. <clears throat> now, very briefly how it works. Uh, we were inspired by ideas of Beller, Beller and Perinella to uh, take molecules and, and, and think about as the, in terms of atomic environment. So when each, 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 each atom is represented by a spherical environment, in our case about a nanometer a sphere to encode its, its, its neighbor. The problem is that the original uh, Beller and Perinella uh, environment, it's, it was designed for, I think, um, silica. So it's very, e it's the easiest of the, of the materials, very homogeneous. And, and basically, in that paper, we reformulate the idea of atomic environment, which is more transferable for complex environments in organic molecules and can handle you know, all your uh, fancy fragments. So in a sense, what you took, uh, the neural network kind of zoom each or one environment at a time. And, and essentially the total energy of the molecule is going to be the sum of those, uh, those uh, environments. Uh, so as John mentioned, essentially what we see emergence and convergence of this hybrid uh, force field. Uh, so first, any uh, generation, uh, essentially you approximate short range uh, fully with the neural network, but you also have a dispersion. For example, you can use D3, uh, D2, Grima type empirical dispersion. And, and again, we use a particular choice of, of density functional theory as a, as a reference. But as that's the empirical uh, to, to describe non-bonded Van der Waals interaction. It's uh, it's empirical, essentially kind of Leonard Jones kind of type. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so now, as as we get more experience, uh, we can we can predict atomic properties. So, for example, partial atomic charges, atomic volumes. Uh, so you can be a little bit more sophisticated, and you can include a dispersion, now we can extend to, for example, Kachenka Scheffler type dispersion, or even many body dispersion. But also we can uh, include electrostatics, and it can be as fancy as you would like, can be charges, you know, dipoles, and, you know, the multiple principle, but still you, you, you parameter, you, you, you describe your short range chemistry with a neural network. And, and, you know, would hopefully I'll have a time, basically we have a new architecture, which is, uh, which is kind of long range because if you if you've seen our atomic environment, they're short range, so we have to uh, use some kind of physical equations to uh, to describe uh, long range interactions. But we have a new architecture which we call AMNet, which is uh, inherently long range, and then you can you can you can implicitly describe all kind of interaction fully inside the neural network. So this will give you a absolutely black box method. Now, very quickly, how it works. Basically, we run a lot of quantum mechanical calculations uh, for small fragment-like organic molecules from one typically to 10, 12 heavy atoms. Then uh, we featureize them through atomic environments, pass them through a neural network, and, and basically do a summation of those essentially fictitious uh, energies of each atomic environment. Uh, and then when you do summation, you, you basically check with your, with your reference quantum mechanical data. So you don't really care about those suspicious energies uh, because of the summation. Then they compute the, uh, the error, compute the cost gradients and update the neural network and basically you iterate. Um, currently we parameterize seven elements. So if you give, if you draw me a molecule with those seven elements, you know, Again, you see it's mostly biogenic elements, so kind of drug-like space. Uh, it will give you energy forces and, and Hessians. We're working to extend it to phosphorus and you know, more collagen, selenium and bromine. Uh, we use uh, omega B97X functional from Martin Head Gordon. This is range separated hybrid functional for those uh, DFTF shadows in, in, the, in, the, in the audience. So we started with double zeta and you know, uh, upgraded to a triple zeta. 
And currently, uh, we, we switch to a, a different, more modern functional. This is your uh, DFTZ uh, here, uh, which is arguably you know, the, the, the best functional that we have today. And also we have uh, a couple cluster CDS uh, neural networks that we train uh, on the couple cluster data. Uh, this is fast, less than a minute. That's hours. Not on a laptop, that's on a, on a, on a machine. Um, Again, uh, so the, the methodological paper been published in 2017, we call it ANI, Deep Neural Network. It's, it's, a, it's an approach to, to train neural network potential and also sampling system. And the question I've been asked, why we call it ANI? Uh, so this is ANI. And what we would like to do, given proper training, so we want to train my Padawan to be DFT Jedi Master, essentially. <laughs> and hopefully, yes, exactly. And hopefully, we would avoid that scenario that you know somebody would be killed in this decision. And probably you should appreciate how hard we work on this convoluted acronym to satisfy, you know, my and Adrian's love to Star Wars, but also, you know, for legal reasons, not to be sued by Lucas. <laughs> uh, uh, so basically, we we try to push, you know, and make this functional into the uh, uh, left corner. Now, let me show you a couple of examples. You know, the machine learning methods and you know models typically criticize the uh, black box method, and I agree with them. So we. We try, to, we try to develop a way how to sense when we can trust them. So uh, in particular, we use uh, methods from um, active learning. Uh, so for example, the simplest way would be to look for the ensemble of disagreement. So you train an ensemble of neural network and see what's the, what's the difference between predictions. And you know, very simply, again, the technical um, in, the, in this paper, imagine you have a certain phase space and you know you you predict a certain point can be energy or properties, and you train as in a special way three different neural networks. <clears throat> now, and you observe certain uh, prediction. Now, what you can see, uh, because we, we can run quantum mechanics, so we can query the oracle and we can uh, basically look for the our true answer, and then you can observe. Okay, so there are regions where neural networks would agree, so we have good data coverage. There are some bad regions uh, when we have either overfitted or we have bad data coverage when, uh, when they disagree. However, what you can notice is that when the, this ensemble is disagreement is large, we can monitor those, those regions, and you don't need quantum mechanics to identify the point. So therefore, new, uh, neural network itself will give you kind of uncertain and to uncertainty the quantification uh, signal can say, hey, don't, don't trust me now. You know, go and you know, you know, run more quantum mechanical calculation and improve. And, and basically what it allows us to do, essentially to use self-consistent, almost fully automated framework how to train those uh, neural network parameters. So you, you throw all your kitchen sink of data sources, you score them, for this, uh, for example, ensemble disagreement, you know, and with, with established uh, criteria, then you run a compute cluster, you know, update the database, retrain the ensemble, and basically this loop is fully automated. So students can, uh, I don't know, eat pizza, drink coffee, and you know, the, the project keep going. So that's nice. And it also, you know, uh, remove this barrier of, the, you know, of this um, manual labor that went to that, uh, 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 making those potential. Uh, the ugly side of the thing is uh, those methods are extremely data hungry. So original ANI one, we had to run 20 million DFT calculation. So our carbon footprint is is, is awful, unfortunately. Uh, uh, but again, we rely on the on the uh, fact that uh, you know chemistry is semi-local, so we use uh, small 
organic almost fragment like molecules from 10, one to the uh, 15 per atom. Now, and then you can test it in, in different regimes. You can, you, you, yes. Uh, so the question was how many molecules? Yes, so yeah, out of this 20 million, we have about 70,000 organic molecules. And for each of them, we have a lot of different conformation out of equilibrium structure, yes. So, so you had, you know, most of, most structures come from out of equilibrium. Uh, uh, this is a GDB database from uh, Jean-Louis Raymond. It's basically enumerated all possible small molecules and candles. So, so. Uh, you can test those things in two different regimes. You can draw your test molecules from the same distribution, take on a small molecule. And this is what's called interpolation. But for us, for chemists, it's not very interesting because we want to try something new. So what all, all tests I'll show you, basically have been done on this unknown, essentially, in extrapolation regime. When we, for example, so this distribution show you sizes of the molecules, so blue corresponds to our training data. You see that it's a, a quite small, but we, we, we develop a set of, uh, you know, a, a test, um, test uh, data set that goes to a 50, 100 heavy atoms, you know, which, that includes, you know, a three peptides, you know, FDA approved drugs and, you know, larger, large organic systems. So we see how it works uh, in a kind of more realistic scenario. And um, we developed, you know, several data sets. So this original data set has 50,000 molecules, 25 million data points, soon, soon to be depreciated because using active learnings, we can be much more data efficient. We also have much more diverse and easier easy to work, but we also have the couple cluster data, which, and that will be released soon. We currently work on the extension with sulfur uh, and halogens, you know, being run in a couple of cluster clusters. Now let me show you kind of, and again, this is, this is available today, and this part will be released probably next month as the, the paper been written. Now, show you kind of accurate, so this is, this is our test molecules. You see you have greasy, drug-like molecules, you have small proteins when you can afford to run quantum mechanical calculation. <clears throat> and so what's the sort of accuracy you can achieve? So you, you, you will get about one to two kcal per mole in total quantum mechanical energy, which is very nicely correspond to a uh, relative energies better than one kcal per mole for most of the system. So I'm showing you a couple of uh, examples of kind of hard system for uh, many uh, quartz fields and you have sulfur, you know, a lot of polarization, you have halogens. And what I'm showing you here, so here on the right is the potential energy surface run with DFT. So if I take a couple of dihedrals and, you know, and, and, and do potential energy scans, and then the left, as from our potential. And as you can see, in many cases, basically, they really on top of each other. And potential can represent, you know, the small little details with kinks and potential energy surface. And the total RMSE, you see, is within one or two kcal per mole for the full, for the full potential. Uh, to give you very, very nice approximation for the potential energy surface. And, uh, um, Unfortunately, we've been a little bit scooped by uh, Johnny de Fabri from Acelera, who implemented actually uh, and beat us in our own soil. So you, he used ANI and two parameterized force field with gas. And so basically, it's from you know, a paper from last month. But essentially, already, you know, he fields, you know, and in many cases, you can, you can easily re replace our force field and do torsion scans and get high accuracy. And essentially in this paper, what they show, it, you, you get the same accuracy fit of your classical force field. Doesn't matter, you use our potential on, on DFT and get your nice for that. <clears throat> uh,
It's neural net. So, yes, it was under Gaff. Gaff too, I guess. Um, uh, other advantage is fully reactive. And uh, currently, we don't have uh, much of training data in the reaction, but in principle, you can do simple chemical reactions. Uh, what I'm putting here, you know, uh, I'm running IRC for particular chemical reaction. Those vertical bars gives my IQ um, uncertainty quantification. As you can see, we have low uncertainty in the products and reactants very high. And as you can see, the transition state is unphysical. Uh, however, if you add a little bit training data, basically you can fix that. And this is your, uh, in the black is the, is the actual gear. And again, I show you out of sample examples. So this particular reaction we are not trained specifically for this, uh, but can also describe chemical reactions. <clears throat> uh, we have courses, so you can run molecular dynamics. And, and basically what you will get, so for example, this particular GSK compound, Again, it has sulfur and halogen. So we run molecular dynamics. We run ab initial molecular dynamics, and then we, we look at the accuracy of the potential energy sources uh, uh, with respect to our potential. Basically, RMSC in energy is essentially within one kcal per mole. So this is the, the magnitude of the force component. It's within three or four kcal per mole per anthem. So again, it's, it's a very low error. Uh, Quantum uh, forces versus uh, forces of the potential. Okay. Absolutely, because our our forces are true gradients of the energy, so it, it's flat as canvas. I guess. Uh, we can do Hessian, so we can do harmonic frequencies. And I may see about twenty-five to thirty-five wave numbers, so you can do decent thermochemistry can to, to calculate. Uh, we get energy harmonic approximation, for example. Uh, so John, you know, mentioned the charges. We actually uh, also train to charges, but in our case, it's a conformer dependent. So it's a quantum fluctuating charges that are three-dimensional geometry dependent. However, the problem with charges, you know, like whole zoo of charge scheme. And you know, for example, there are several here. You have seen five here shows NBO. As you can see, if you do charges. The very little correlation between different charges. So we went and asked different questions. So dipole and quadrupole are physical observable. So we asked neural network, hey neural network, re reconstruct dipole and perhaps constrain the quadrupole, but assign charges. What what and what this paper describes essentially we rediscover a CM5 scheme which has been fitted to experimental dipole, but this was unbiased. And a little bit surprising that essentially if you constrain, if you constrain and, and, and try to reproduce a dipole and quadruple, uh, basically you can essentially uh, reconstruct a same five scheme. And, and again, since it's in, in neural network, it takes a few milliseconds to do. Yeah, so, so, so we went to the, you know, we constrained dipoles and the neural network was, recon was assigning charges to reconstruct the type. Simply from the derivative of the quantum dipole, and in fact, we kept, um, if, if you insist that the uh, dipole um, is is fit, you you get a, a a unique set of charges which reproduce the energy yeah. as you said, and you can go on and get dipoles from the quadrupole moments yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 But in principle, it was interesting surprise as those charges might be arbitrary, but they were nicely correlated at least with this kind of. Yes. Yeah, this is all gas phase okay. at this point. Right, so um, uh, I'd be pleased to see what you've done with solution two because this um, this is this is great, but it but it's always a challenge to do things in water and things have, like that. We have not done anything in charges in solution yet at this point. Um, 
then what we can do, we can, now we have energy, our forces, we have our charges and dipoles, we can run, you know, for example, and simulate IR spectra and gas phase, you know, and compare with QM, for example. And, and basically you can get very nice IR spectra from running essentially MD time domain simulation. So everything done by, you know, few, few machine learning methods. Um, uh, very easy to use. Uh, we are, you know, uh, we use Python. So, for example, again, I, I'm not venturing to run in a live simulation. So, I just take screenshots. Basically, you read your XYZ and the SDF file. You can instantiate the calculator. So, you use any model. You can get potential energy. <laughs> and then, For example, you can get forces. You can use your standard methods, minimize geometry, and check that forces more or less converged. And then you can do, for example, vibrations. And then, so that was a water molecule. So again, you get three, 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 three normal modes. So it looks like water, all positive. So this looks good. And finally, you can do full thermochemistry. You can do, you know, zero point energy and basically all the standard stuff uh, in the harmonic approximation. So there are a couple of examples in, in our GitHub. Now, uh, there are certain applications where the DFT may not be enough. And I've been looking on that. And in particular, uh, what we try to attack the problem. So the amount of data required to train these things is, is very high. We cannot do conventional couple cluster, uh, despite the progress in the big machines. So we have to be smart. So what we come up uh, with the extrapolation scheme, uh, which essentially use approximate couple cluster with so-called DLP-NO approximation. And essentially, if, you, if you're familiar, so this is a standard scheme of the Helgaker, how to do a complete basis set extrapolation uh, to the, you know, uh, using the, the standard couple cluster scheme. So essentially, these terms would kill you because this is the 07 Kalin. So what we come up with this inside extrapolation scheme inside the extrapolation. So we have kind of this, like in this moving inception, right? And uh, however, what you what is interesting is to take a couple of standard benchmarks, you run standard couple cluster, and you can really see. So, for example, you go from alanine to aspirin, so it's, you double the system size. So you your CPU, you know, uh, essentially grows exponentially, right? Uh, so we, in 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 our work, basically, we we can much we can mitigate this run while maintaining respectable accuracy uh, using the approximate couple cluster scheme. So what the scheme allows us to do, we can scale up couple cluster calculations. And, and we actually run half a million of them on a large machine with Solomas. And, and then we also had to use a different tricks with full transfer learning. When we use our DFT potential as, the, as, uh, as essentially as a cheap proxy, and, you know, but, but also gives you a nice, you know, a rough approximation of potential energy surface. And then we can use a smart sampling where DFT is wrong to kind of fix that. So what we do, you, 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 you basically, you copy weights of your, of your neural network that's been trained on DFT. Then you, you know, you freeze part of the weight. And then you use, you know, this transfer learning technique with the sampling to retrain only part of your neural network with couple cluster data. And essentially what you get is Frankenstein. It's neither couple cluster nor the DFT. Uh, however, what we show in, the, in this paper, as published recently, basically in many applications, that neural network is higher in accuracy in DFT. We, well, we tried, but typically you constrain bottom layer and you, you retrain on the top, top layer. So I'll show you just a couple of examples. Uh, I'll skip technical detail. Uh, so for example, um, the reaction energy. So the simple hydrocarbon, so it's an interesting data set of hydrocarbon reaction energies. And if you look the simple, you know, there's nothing fancy in this. Uh, but if you look for high quality reference for energy, so what plots give you, so there's a six, rea you know, seven reaction energies and on y and axis is, a, is an error. 
if you look for our functional, so omega B97X in red, the errors in this reaction energies vary from you know, 12 to 40 kcal per mole error. It's a disaster. If you have reaction, you know, error in reaction energy of 40 kcal per mole, it's total disaster, right? So obviously neural network potential been trained on, on this DFT mimics uh, those errors. So our errors as bad as it were worse. However, given a little bit couple cluster data, so this uh, light, you know, teal kind of uh, color, so neural network potential been trained with transfer learning, essentially, you know, get it to the one or two kcal per mole. And again, none of the system were in the training data. No, those are thermochemistry products. You know, it's yeah. So it's 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 reaction energy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is gas phase again. It's 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 gas phase reaction energy. Yeah, here there is there is no barrier yet. So this is just a reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. It's a thermodynamics exactly. Thank you. Um, uh, there is an interesting test data set uh, from Genentech by Alberta who run. Uh, various uh, torsion benchmarks uh, with different levels of theory uh, for drug-like molecules. And, and essentially we can get all those the, the hydral profiles quite accurate. You know, again, DFT is not bad, but it, it overestimates, for example, it might be up, underestimate the, you know, higher conformers, but basically with the, with the couple cluster training, you, you get essentially on top of that. And, you know, in this paper, uh, there are many of those. <clears throat> now, so this is kind of a summary of the benchmark uh, of the of the whole uh, of the whole data set. So this is your force field you should not name, and there's a various types. So any one X train on DFT essentially somewhere in between the MP2 and you know the B3 leap with the couple cluster data. So it's essentially it exceeds all the all the all the DFT functional. Uh, been tested and it's approaching the, your fancy, you know, uh, post Hartree-Fock methods that use either um, some composite scheme as MP2 2.5 or some kind of extrapolation. So we basically we can get the torsion really, really accurate. Uh, okay. Um, very recently, we've been working, can we go beyond just simple energy? And we've been thinking about, you know, how to expand different architectures. So for example, you know, this is the essentially a phase on your architecture when you um, use atomic environment, which essentially fix type descriptor for your, and then you feed it to neural network. So we've been trying to do, you know, work hard to explore different, you know, fancy architecture and in particular, can we use learn embeddings? Can we use message passing to describe long range interactions? So I, in, in, in the, and, I'll, and also can we train to multiple things? There is no reason why you, uh, to preventing you to train to multiple things. And in particular, you know, I'll fortunately have to skip technical part, but uh, in this particular paper, we, we train to eight quantities. We have gas phase energy, yes, SMD energy, so this is your uh, continuum solvent approximation, and then atomic charges, atomic volumes, things like that. So you have, you can have multiple properties. An advantage of that, so inside neural network, it's more data efficient. So more quantities you train, easier each one is get. And also, in terms of simulation, you will get all of them in one single part. So this will additionally accelerate, you know, your kind of simulation, you will have two properties. Uh, predictions as a separate exercise and uh, and also uh, you know we have this message passing uh, layer sorry go back oh. okay uh, we have this message passing layers that allow us actually to put all those long-range interactions inside the neural network and maybe we, we 
we can um, keep using those, you know, uh, standard physics based methods. Okay. Show you a couple of examples. So, for example, um, so m net is, is is t equal one. So it's 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 one pass. So essentially, it's no it's no long range. Um, is yet so essentially it's uh, equal accuracy in any but as 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 you as you increase and and you pass messages more environment essentially you you reduce the error and it allows you to get more accurate um, energy and for example a clear example would be if I take those substructure so I have sulfur which is very polarizable and I have the substituent R and if I modulate you know electron withdrawal or donating uh, uh, type of the R, I can modulate the sulfur charge here. So if we use atomic environment, and for example, this R more than five angstrom away, so this, the standard way how we, we predict charges will not fit R. And essentially all my charges would be equal because it doesn't, it doesn't fill this R. But as I pass messages, I can essentially recover the correct behavior and, the, and kind of the long, uh, long range influence of the R with respect to the, uh, to the charges. That's one example. Um, we can get, again, uh, solvation free energies and, and that's we use MMSOL database and which, which reference the, the free energy of solvation. And basically now you can do relatively accurate solvation free energy just with machine learning. So you can use uh, you know, the, the standard <laughs> Uh, equation and we'll get RMSC about 1.8 pixel per mole, which is kind of on the on par if you use two different models or two different functionals or you know approaches uh, for this data. <clears throat> now let me spend a couple of minutes just to show you a few things where I think it's going. So we currently work with the group of Phoenix. Uh, it's um, it's a software for protein crystal structure refinement uh, from uh, Pavel, who is at Berkeley. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab, and basically there is a there's a lot of excitement about excitement about high AM, and one of the one of the way how you reconstruct a, a crystal structure you use quantum refinement, and this long and very complicated pipeline, we use quantum mechanical calculations to to get better you know mapping of the atoms to the density. So what they use right now, probably the fastest quantum mechanical code so called TerraChem. However, there are a few drawbacks. Basically, it's very expensive. Basically, you, you, you must have a, a Tesla GPUs and, and, and for large proteins takes weeks. Uh, so the work right now, basically, if you plug it in on it, it's free for academia. It, it runs on a laptop. And basically, you can, you can refine and make it. I, will not show you uh, fresh crystal structure refinement with any yet, but I'll show you uh, a, a, a quick example of what we will be able to do. So for example, you go to PDB, take a particular protein, we have a ligand here, uh, so it has all seven elements uh, in the structures, and again, I take my potential, which is currently in development, and has not been trained to this particular protein, so we, Internally, add some water data and you know simple amino acids uh, dimers, and and basically I can set up a simulation. So it's 35,000 atoms, explicit water. It's a box standard. The only place I'm cheating there is no ions. So this is your distilled water protein solution. And and I run it. And it runs. We run it for several nanoseconds, and this is really boring movie. But I argue this is a great achievement. It didn't explode, didn't default, and things didn't go weird. So given enough data and not, not seen any you know, full protein, at least it stayed stable for a low number of nanoseconds. The, the ligand is inside the active site. We see the hydrogen bonding contact. You know, there's your loop, so things like, okay. So they give us a hope that, you know, we can, we can parameterize, you know, a, a protein ligand force field given uh, not infinite amount of quantum mechanical data.
and only five nanoseconds. A I mean, disclaimer. it's been shown that you know you need to go out past microseconds. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I totally you, agree. And it may be milliseconds to get a protein absolutely. equilibration. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, I I totally agree. But it, just to show the qualitatively, it it that you can do it. We, we hope to do it. But also, I think it's uh, what is more interesting. The students who run the simulation make probably the most common mistake. So this is um, aspartic acid, this is arginine, and the, the, the carboxyl is protonated. And this is probably by far the, the common mistake when you mess up the protection state. So when you run a simulation, speed of the movie, but basically you see the, the proton transfer. So this, this, this potential is reactive. It's a neural network. Everything inside the neuron. Yeah. So that protein simulation been run inside the, this is the neural network. So by potential, I mean the neural net, which we trained on the quantum data. Did you actually have training examples where you had proton transfers or is this just some? Not specifically this. So we have, since we use normal modes, basically, the, but, the protons, we have enough okay. examples where protons far, far between, right? they, they, they fly because the sample in the energy window to yes, KKL. But you have to have an example where there's something that accepts the proton at the same time as something that we donates. You might have, you might have something Maybe. like a, we, 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 we have, it might an asset with a data, with yeah, a yeah. beta carbonyl or yeah. something like that. Yeah. But we have not trained specifically, so we take the arginine and you know cannot train for that. But maybe if we do wood, we add a little bit. Um, so it's reactive. And now uh, well, one more question, if that's yeah. okay. If you come go back. Um, at the very beginning, you talked about decompositioning this whole thing into various input vectors, where you have five angstrom regions that. Yeah scan for the structure. Is this still the process that you're using here? That's we run with Amber. So we, we use standard picture, you know. Okay. Yeah. So there is a there is a Wonderwall. Oh okay that's all yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. But the but the this is handled essentially by neural network. What is what is? Okay, can I have one more question? Yes. Uh, so uh, I believe that everything was trained on single molecule data, right? The the energies. So and I also understand that uh, if you expand this to a uh, many molecule problem, it, it's not a problem because there is no bond in your model. Yep. But uh, did you uh, did you make any adjustment for the fact that some reactions might be uh, entropy driven? And did you incorporate? Again, this movie is somehow. qualitative. So I okay. have no idea how accurate. And, and if it's proton transfer, you have to be probably use paneling mm -hmm. and, and to do it right anyway. Do, do you think it uh, might be interesting to approximate some of the uh, entropy factors in this model? If you're doing MD, then the entropy consistent with the potential energy surface is correct. You just have to, you know, calculate the right function of what you're doing. So you'll get crossing, recrossing stuff. All right. But in theory, by doing MD, your entropy is included. If you're doing, you know, Q8 quasi harmonic, then you know, more complicated. And the reason for that is if you're training, if you get the energy surface correct, correctly, your it all properties follow. So then, if the energy surface is correct and you do MD, you get the entropy. So you don't necessarily have to train on that specific. I guess I could ask, ask this now. You might get to it later. So the question I always ask is. Uh, What's the density of you know, water, ethanol, it's cyclohexane? Water. Yeah. It's tried water. And it gives you this, you know, DFT plus dispersion will give you 0.994, something like that. So it's not bad. Okay. 
So they're like, then like the temperature dependence and what about, you know, we try some alcohol. things. I, this is not the best right. water model, right? but you know, it, it's okay for, it's not terrible. Right. That's if you so it's, let me, yeah. it's also liquid. Mm -hmm. under ambient condition which mm -hmm. is a big achievement which is good so, so i think i think that's what i'd love to see in a lot of these force fields is actually you know what are the condensed phase properties look like I mean, there's there's all these matches to qm but if you want to use it for proteins then the question is Absolutely. You know, yes. I, I would love to see in more of these papers let's see what the liquid properties look like yes okay. so we started from down and we slowly creeping up so we'll, we'll do tests on on diffusions and densities and so is that the version with Leonard Jones and electrostatic correction of any? So where yes. you have yes. both of them? Yes. Okay. So then you get water. Yes, yes. So, so the, the development version has water clusters, molecules, and high chain. Yes. Limited, but some. Um, 10%. Pleasant. So, uh, on top of your purple helix there in front, is that a, hyd a hydronium no, IMIC? It's because I, I use a radii to visualize a, a sphere. So, this thing is just what's the cutoff? So yep. Just from water. But it looks like there's a water with three protons attached to it. This one? Yeah. That's, that's, there's, there's something behind. I see. So, this is, this is just water. Okay, and so that's probably not a, a hydroxide, a little bit no, over no, no. to the so left. Those of artifacts that. from VMD, you know, collection probably. Okay. That's because oxygen. As long as they're VMD artifacts and not neural net artifacts. Yes. <laughs> How long does it take? Okay. Well, I the question. Okay. Okay. How long did it take? the simulation for five minutes? Uh, so since it's reactive, I cannot do two femtoseconds with two water which is what you use for ab initio and gym. And it's probably five, five to 10 times at this point more expensive at neural network sites and classic ones. So it's, at this point it's probably 50 times lower. So you cannot fold the protein quantum just yet. So I, 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 have, I have another comment, sorry to be picky. So <laughs> I looked at this uh, picture now for quite a while. So your, your arginine, um, is this also a VMD artifact that you don't even start from neutral arginine residue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a student mistake. So that was a mistake. Because I, I would be impressed if it's like a neutral arginine and you have a proton transfer from, from your acid to, no, no, to no, make no. It a positive it was, arginine. It so a it's correct. a negatively charged arginine. No, 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 no. That was a neutral arginine. It's and neutral. it became plus minus. Because I, I see a, a two binding nitrogen, two valence nitrogen there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Okay. Alexander, if I may ask a question, this is Thomas Fox from Bering Ingelheim from Remote. Um, I'd like, I'd like to, to, to see this work, kind of having the whole protein um, with, with a neural net approach. Uh, my experience, I tried that uh, same thing with, um, say, polyalanine, polycysteine uh, with increasing size, something like five, six, seven, eight alanines in a row. Um, Come, came up this, uh, well, with 300, 400 uh, confirmations, and then calculate the DFT um, energies and the uh, AIMnet um, uh, energies of these. And I get uh, kind of differences of five, seven, 10 um, kcals. I get an overall R squared of 0.8. I wonder, given already that these small very small systems, you get such, such a difference between the IMNET uh, energies and the uh, DFT energies. How would you ever think of uh, being able to simulate whole, pr whole protein? So that we hope to do with the, you know, um, active learning. When you do a few cycles, when, when you pass your data sets and you do a few iterations to kind of look what parts of the potential energy surface have higher error. But 
when you do this few iterations, then it rapidly gets, you know, uh, much, much better quality of prediction. If you just do single points, it probably, and uh, did you use the pub? Uh, yeah, obviously. So you use the, the, the AMNet from the public repository. Exactly. Which, which, which doesn't include any, you know, intermolecular interaction data and things like that. So what I'm showing you is the developer's version when we have some, you know, uh, clusters and, you know, uh, intermolecular interaction. The one which is in, in GitHub, you know, it's just a guess. Just isolated molecules in a gun. So yes, but if, even those, it's just it's just isolated molecules, 40 atoms, 50 atoms, uh, then it should work according to your uh, your presentation. Let, let's, you know, let's go offline and, you know, send us things and we can, we can, you know, we're happy to look. Okay, perfect. So let me finally, show you even crazier things. Uh, what we add is the, this reaction carbon-carbon bond breaker. This, this movie is probably you know, uh, wrong, but the, the, the thing is that so far what we train the small molecules and you know, are breaking a carbon-carbon bond in the, in the organic molecule. But then when the students set up this crazy simulation, so you have carbon vapor, so it's 4,000 atoms, 60 atoms, uh, 60 atoms, 60 Anstrom box, high temperature simulation, so you start from random gas. And when you observe this reactive simulation, you see formation of flakes. There is a formation of fullerene here, so it's a bucket ball and you know rotten things and you know and it's interesting so the quantitatively this simulation is probably one because they active learning and uncertainty quantification through the roof but what is interesting is it learns enough to suck carbon and six membrane rings into flakes buckyballs and nanotubes so it learns enough chemistry or physics to to kind of you know get that it also get partially right uh, the way how this graphene flakes uh, grow by doing a chain of you know floppy chain of carbons and then you know taking next carbon so you get you get some physics already correct and that that actually gives a hope we can do you know high quality reactive potential and we will not need to do it reaction by reaction when all 50 volumes of organic reaction books. And what is also interesting that probably seven years ago, so late Professor Marakuma published a science paper doing this simulation. Took them a year only to run on a big machine to do a Venetian simulation. That can be done on the laptop. So that gives you, you know, us, as Ross used to say, 99% of chemists who don't have access to big machines. I think it will give us uh, interesting tools to solve new science. Is the, That's an incredible result, I think, at least to me, getting the, with the react, getting uh, nanotubes, etc. Um, your input information to this neural net had nothing but for example but molecules so the way your neural net knows about the carbon carbon reaction we, we add a little bit carbon carbon bond breaking oh. from molecule however we not show any carbon nanostructure we show carbon bond breaking information as the you know i show the reaction exercise essentially we show different like um Carbon carbon distances. Carbon carbon dissociation formation okay. builds alder, you know, things I like see. that. Oh, so you trained it for that. But, it, but it's been trained only to molecular data. Right. Okay. All right. Hmm. There, there was, you know, IRCs for this reaction. Fascinating. So this is literally awesome stuff. Like 
incredibly cool. So I, I just wanted to ask about two aspects, one of which is the speed. You mentioned a 50 different time speed difference, but between like OpenMM on a similar system, I get like 15,000 times. So how do, how do we close the speed gap between that? And the, we had this discussion. You can probably fix it, but harmonic restrain, but then you kind of defeat the purpose, right? You want to avoid reactivity to increase the time step. I don't know. Maybe the custom is, is it really the time step that's the main limiting factor? It's because 10X. I, I think it's, we could do the next. Like, there's a lot of tricks that one yeah. could do in to get that close that down. So we should, should talk about we, that. We, we should try one of your integrators. The, the other question is the you know the the folks over here have been finding that um, uh, quantum nuclear effects are a major. Uh, effect in anything that involves hydrogen bonding properties, right? So anything water, anything hydrogen bonds, um, that's probably important for proteins and small molecules. So it, how do you deal with the quantum nuclear effects? Would, are you thinking this would just go full path integral? Are you thinking that you don't need it? Or are you thinking that no, no, you, you could fit to condensed phase to correct? Initial, yeah, even if you run ab initial and V, you need to couple it to plus integral or some kind of method. So that's as easy to interface. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe, you know, you'll have, because there's a lot of startups who do the fancy neural architecture chips. If they can, you know, you can run, you know, we use standard PyTorch software stack. So if there is going to be a custom chip that can run it faster, you can use it. Uh, okay. Great, yeah. Excellent. Okay, great, yeah. I'm just, uh, I think it's really cool and thank you for sharing it. I, I sort of wonder whether as you go through this, do you eventually occasionally just come up with something weird that happens? Oh, absolutely. Oh, can you I tell us about I that? I should do. Well, there are, you know, we work with several groups and of course, you know, the, there are some geometries get wrong. You know, for example, because at short range, there are some conjugated system, not fully planar. A little bit banded. There were some issues early on in the NITRA group to get two parameters because we get too many. You know, there are, there are certain things. But I think the advantage of that, because as a user community, you know, at least the people who work with, they send us those weird structures once in a while. And then we retrain, we, we can retrain and typically fix the problem, but don't break anything else. At least what we think. The, as you go with reactive stuff, it's, 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 it's not going to be simple. I'll show you good cases, but you know, since there is no physical constraints, you know, things get really weird. You know, for example, you can get two atoms too close together and it's some kind of weird minima. So we, we still probably have to carefully inform users what is the main applicability of that. Because as soon as you go out, and there is no data, so you have absolutely no physical guarantees whatsoever uh, to run it. And at this point, since there's a student-driven development, so we have yeah. zero warnings in our code whatsoever. Okay, thanks. So let me finish. So it's uh, so on GitHub. Uh, it's coming, you know, soon in your favorite packages. So it started from Amber, Alberta did. OpenMM, we work in the slums. So if you're interested and you know, tell us you know, what other packages we need to consider. Again, AMNet on GitHub, data, data set is here. We work with a number of academic labs, some of your friends or competitors. And thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. So, so what sort of investigation is going on for, are, are there better basis functions to be using? Different combinate, you know, different ways of, yeah, basically different basis functions. What, what potentials are there for getting something that's maybe a little more transferable with better basis functions? So when you, when you triple zeta basis, it's sorry, no, I, I meant the, like the basis functions for the neural net, like how do oh. you not not the quantum? Oh, you said that. Uh, 
it's kind of settled so we you, you know we kind of know it works so at this point i don't know if we ever hit the limitation of the descriptor or you know we get yeah, sorry the, i should have used the word descriptors yes yeah <laughs> like so how do you I, know if it's like the best set of descriptors are better descriptors? i have no idea we, we, we come up with one mm -hmm. we use it we kind of advertise it but there are a few other types different neural networks uh, what is kind of interesting so it's almost like a wild west right yeah so people come up with this amazing things and try and I, you know maybe in a few years it will settle down there will be few more mature it seems like there must be some way to like you know what is the minimal you know descriptor space that's the smallest that that captures things the best it seems like coming up with like a good way to quantify quality of descriptors is yeah, important I had this to discussion. make and, things you know, transferable um, or more transferable. Uh, the thing is, you know, for you, it seems fascinated. And I've been on another conference and say, no, 1K KMO, it's terrible. It's awful. So some people think 1K KMO, it's, it's unacceptable accuracy. But there are many, many applications. We can have a lot of mileage out of this accuracy. So you never, you know, there will be always many opinions about what is acceptable or not. I'm just curious, was the conference you were at a crystal packing conference? No, that was um, quantum chemists. That there oh, were people who do very accurate, you need like one way number accuracy for. Oh, yeah, oh, those okay. people are, yes. Um, would it be possible to go back to the slide where you showed the fit with the forces and the energies, the or two MD. curves. Uh, yeah, I think it was an MD. It was a while ago. I guess I have a good memory. Yes. There you go. Um, this was done with a uh, a force force field representation for the non-bond or this was done with uh, this is isolated um, molecule just neural network there is no Lorentz law range it's just one molecule and the whole simulation is done with the neural net yes and then we take snapshots run qm right. calculated energy and forces and that's the error for forces because one of the things uh, Uri Denor and I found was that <clears throat> there's uh, the forces, there, the, a huge component of the forces on atoms in polar systems is, uh, the, is charge flux, which is not accounted for in standard representations, but I guess it should be here. Uh. Again, you approximate whole physics in a black box neural network, mm -hmm. so it's hard to partition. But, but this is kind of a simpler case because it's gas space. Okay. Thank you. Can you elaborate on how you transfer the, the long range information a bit more? Uh, you can do two ways. Long range, you plug it into standard MD package. No, uh, the implicit oh, version. Oh, the implicit, okay. Ah, okay. So we have update vectors. And so you originally have embeddings, which is kind of atomic environment. When you do one pass, your central atom essentially collects information. You, you know, think about passing message. As soon as you're within one environment, we have vector for every atom inside this environment through, sp through, through space. There is no bonds, basically. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you, you, you sort of learn interaction inside your one environment. And then we have this pass, essentially, like a residual connection that you can loop over and then you pass these messages to your neighbor's environment. And when you iterate, you essentially pass messages through this environment. Or 
yeah, so, so you have learnable vectors and, and basically you iterate kind of like, it's almost like SCF loop, which, you know, it's kind of iterative, but there's no variational principle, you know, it's just a nice analogy. So when they iterate, so essentially you kind of, you know, look what neighbor of neighbors in, in the, you know, in the space. And basically by this you learn, oh, I have something over there and there. Does it? And if, you, if you're interested in basically in the equations, so I'm, I'm happy to 